see you guys later. <laughs> Who are you? You have been quiet about the secrets of tire grip for too long. What are you, what are you talking about? Why do wider tires have more grip? Seriously? One of your henchmen knocks me out, brings me here, because you want to know why wider tires have more grip. YouTubers get it wrong all the time, yet you don't say a word about it. We don't appreciate that. <laughs> what? Exhibit A. The contact patch, there should be grip to spare. False. Friction force between rubber and pavement is damn near described by F equals mu N. Surface area of the contact patch, well, it has nothing to do with it. Exhibit B. We've mentioned this in previous videos, Hamilton's law of friction. What this is telling us in basic terms is that grip comes from weight, not the size of our contact patch. Yeah, but do I really have to crack that? I really like those guys and their YouTube channels. And besides, this is a common misconception. Well, hand us what you know. Right now. Wait, 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 what, what, what is he doing? Oh, he's just checking how scratch resistant the paint is. That's all. He'll be fine. Okay, calm down now. I'll give you what you want. Tell us the dark secrets of tire grip. Okay, okay. It all starts with how rubber generates friction. So why is there a confusion about how rubber friction works in the first place? Well, I think this comes from the fact that most people have heard of Hampton's laws of friction. They state that the force of friction is directly proportional to the applied load, and that the friction force is independent of the apparent area of contact. So we get the equation friction force equals mu, or the coefficient of friction, times the normal force. So, let's figure out an experiment. If we take this piece of cardboard, and we put it on a glass table, apply some load to it, and try to pull it across the table, this is going to require a certain amount of force. If we cut out a smaller piece of this cardboard, conduct the same experiment, it will require the same amount of force to pull it across the table. So yes indeed, the friction force in this case is independent of the apparent area of contact. However, there's a big problem here. What do you think that is? Well, cardboard is not the same material as tires are made out of. Tires are made out of rubber. Say we conduct the same test as we just talked about, but with a rubber block. So we take the rubber block, we put it on top of a glass table, we put some weight on it, and then we try to pull it across the table. The first interesting thing we will find is that the coefficient of friction is probably going to be above 1. That's kind of strange. The second interesting thing we will find is that as we apply more load on top of it, the coefficient of friction will decrease. So in other words, Ampton's laws of friction are not that helpful when trying to understand rubber friction. Rubber generates friction in three major ways. Adhesion, deformation, and where? So how does rubber adhere to the tarmac? Well, an hypothesis is that it is the result of momentary molecular bonding between the rubber and the tarmac. So the more area in contact, the larger the adhesive forces and thus more grip. So a larger contact patch provides more grip than a smaller one. Because real surfaces are really rough on a molecular scale, contact between the tire and the tarmac is limited to the highest bumps on each of the two surfaces. If we apply more vertical load on the tire, this increases the area of contact, providing more grip. Deformation, also called mechanical keying, happens when lateral and vertical loads on the tire causes sharp bumps in the tarmac to penetrate the rubber. The rubber and tarmac keys together, and this generates friction. When deformation forces are high enough, the rubber starts to tear. Anyone who's been on a racetrack has probably seen this phenomenon before. Tearing absorbs energy, and this creates more friction forces. Another important aspect we need to understand about tires is that tires are viscoelastic, meaning that tires conform to bumps and surfaces, but they do not fully rebound after the deformation. Try to push your fingernail into a racing slick, and you will find that the mark will stay there for a long amount of time. Now do the same thing with a road tire, 
and you're going to find that the mark is going to disappear almost immediately. So why is there a difference between race slicks and road tires in this respect? Well, race slicks are generally made from what's called high hysteresis or high energy loss rubber. High energy loss rubber generally generates more grip. When high hysteresis rubber deforms because of mechanical keying, it generates a shape that resists sliding better than low hysteresis rubber which results in higher friction forces. Remember we said that as the vertical load increases on the tire, the area of contact increases. Well, another important aspect to understand about rubber is that rubber is sensitive to vertical load. As the vertical load increases, the lateral friction forces that can be developed are at a diminishing rate. So in other words, as you load up the tire vertically, you will not see a one-to-one -one gain in tire friction. A simplified explanation to this is that as the rubber deforms into the tiny bumps in the road, it eventually reaches the bottom, meaning the contact patch is as large as it can be and cannot generate more friction. This also explains the diminishing rate, considering the way the contact patch grows. As you probably already know, tires have what is called an optimum operating temperature. The temperature affects how soft the rubber is and thus how well it adheres, deforms and tears on the tarmac, heavily influencing the amount of available grip. We talked about how the rubber is pushed down into the tiny bumps and the road surface. Wouldn't this also be affected by the shape and variety of those tiny bumps? Yes, of course. The texture of the tarmac affects how the rubber adheres, deforms and tears. Practically, this influences what compound would be used for different tracks. Manufacturers of race slicks usually have a recommendation for which compound fits what roughness of the track surface. Let's conclude what we learned so far. It's very important that you understand that thus far, we've only talked about rubber friction. We haven't actually talked about pneumatic tires. I'll explain what I mean by that in a bit. So for rubber friction, we understand that the contact patch is very important. We also understand that rubber is viscoelastic. Different rubber compounds have different levels of hysteresis, which affects the available grip. We also understand that rubber is load sensitive. So there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between adding more vertical load and getting more lateral grip. We also understand that rubber is temperature sensitive. So a higher temperature makes the rubber softer. We also understand that we have to consider the road's roughness when thinking about the rubber friction. For a pneumatic tire, we have to consider that the carcass deforms under load. We also have to understand that it deforms differently dependent on the lean angle of the motorcycle. We also have to understand that the entire tire acts like a shock absorber. The way the carcass deforms is affected by the tire's pressure, profile, and size. A lower pressure, assuming that we're staying within the recommended pressures for a certain tire, will result in a larger contact patch. And a higher vertical load will also increase the size of the contact patch. When leaning the motorcycle into a corner, the carcass deforms laterally, radially, and tangentially. This deformation is affected by the tire pressure, profile, and size. A tire with a high aspect ratio, which is the sidewall height as a percentage of the width, deforms more under these loads and provide more shock absorption. Under extreme lean angles, a high aspect ratio can be preferred because the suspension is at such a disadvantage that most of the suspension must come from the tires. Higher aspect ratio tires usually have a more triangular profile, which provides a larger contact patch at higher lean angles. Wider tires generally have more grip, but it's not because the contact patch area is larger. In fact, for the same internal pressure and vertical load, a wider tire will have the same contact patch area as a narrower one. The difference is in the shape of the contact patch. So why is the shape so important? To grasp this, we need to understand slip angle and camber thrust. Let's first discuss how a four-wheeled vehicle turns, as this will help us understand the concept of slip angle. Until you turn the front wheels of a car, the car wants to go in a straight line. When the front wheels are turned into the corner, the car's trajectory will not follow exactly where the wheel is pointed. 
the angle between where the wheel is pointing and the direction in which it is actually traveling is known as the slip angle. Since a motorcycle leans into the corner, this works in a slightly different way. A counter steering maneuver is applied to lean the motorcycle over, where the front wheel is pointed in the opposite direction of the turn for a brief moment. As the bike is leaned over, the front wheel is steered into the corner. As the lean angle increases, the tire's contact patch flattens and deforms. This makes the tire want to turn around a very tight radius cone. The radius of this cone is smaller than the bend radius. This is the main mechanism which generates the corning force on a bike, called camber thrust. So do motorcycles actually experience tire slip when cornering? Yes, at higher lean angles. According to Tony Foll in his book Motorcycle Handling and Chassis Design, from around 20 to 40 degrees of lean angle, maximum slip reaches around 2 degrees. But a major increase happens between 40 and 45 degrees. At 45 degrees of lean angle, about 6 degrees of slip is needed to maintain a balanced turn and lean angle. Tire technology has certainly come a long way since 2002 when this was written, so the numbers have definitely changed. But this helps us understand how slip angle works. At high degrees of slip angle, portions of the contact patch is sliding, thus producing less amounts of traction. You have an area that still sees adhesive friction and an area that is slipping. When the tire slips, the leading edge of the contact patch curves towards the turn, and the rearward portion lags behind. A long, narrow contact patch, such as one on a narrow tire, has a smaller area that still sees large amounts of adhesive friction, as compared to a wider contact patch under large slip angles. This is primarily why wider tires have more grip. So why doesn't all bikes have wider tires? But wider tires weigh more, which adds to the unsprung mass of the motorcycle, making the suspension's job a little bit harder. We also have to remember that wider tires require more lean angle. Then again, wider tires are more thermally stable. And hypothetically speaking, you can run at lower pressures, which means that you get a larger contact patch. It's always a trade-off, as with everything in motorcycle dynamics. What about tread design? Well, on a completely dry and clean tarmac surface, adding any tread to the tire is going to lessen the amount of available grip. A couple of decades ago, race engineers believed that adding tread could have some cooling effect on the tire. This has since been disproven. So why would you ever want tread on a tire? Well, what happens if it rains? Rain tires, as well as street tires, have a tread pattern to mitigate hydroplaning. Hydroplaning happens when water have nowhere to go from under the tire, and the tire rides on top of it. This is solved by adding grooves to the tires, which channels the water away, allowing the tread to be in contact with the road. Knobbies are a completely different story, and there are many different types of dirt bike tires, which would require a lot of explanation, so I will leave those out in this video. Let's conclude what we learned today. We understand that grip is highly affected by the contact patch size and shape. We also understand that tire selection is crucial if we want to maximize the available grip. Different tires have different compounds and different carcass constructions, which deflects in different ways. We understand that pressure and temperature are key concepts to understand if we want to maximize grip. We also understand that if we want to really get into this, it's very important how we set up the motorcycle, because this affects how the load transfer happens when we ride it. Now, of course, this also comes down to how we ride it. Remember to subscribe to my channel. There is always something new to learn. Gotta be against the law to look this damn good. Cause baby, I feel real good and I wish I would.